talking about lengths and distances, biochemists are rebels. We use a couple of non-standard units, the angstrom and the micron. So a micron is a micrometer, um, and so it is about the size of a bacterial cell, and so we can use like a 0.2 micron filter in order to sterilize media. Sometimes we need to talk about even smaller things, and so we have the angstrom. And so the angstrom, as we'll talk about, it's 0.1 nanometers, so it's like 100 picometers, or like 10 to the minus 10th meters. Um, basically, it's about the length of a, a carbon-hydrogen bond, and so a carbon-carbon bond is about one and a half angstrom. So we often use these terms when we're talking about the resolution in structures and how far apart the different atoms are in proteins. Um, and so when you talk about higher resolution, we have shorter distances in angstrom, meaning we can actually tell apart the distances of the different atoms. And if we get to around one and a half angstrom resolution, we're actually able to tell apart all those different carbons in the structure. And so you might hear about atomic resolution. And so when we're doing that, we're often talking in terms of angstrom. And so neither angstrom nor micron are actually like official SI or like standard international uh, units. Um, that's just why I call us rebels. So micron actually was, but then it got demoted um, because then they decided to use micro to mean 10 to the minus 6. So that's just one of the cool facts that I'm going to talk about today as well as what these how we use these terminology, when we use these terminology, how to do some conversions, and also nanometers, because we're not rebels all the time, um, so we often use nanometers when we're talking about wavelengths, such as if we're measuring UV absorption at 280 nanometers to try to figure out where a protein is, like coming off of a column or something. So basically, today I want to talk about angstroms, microns, so it's a micro micrometer, um, and also the nanometer. So talking really tiny things. So let's go. In science, we have this thing called like the International System of Units or the SI. And basically we have these base units. So these are things like seconds for times and meter for length. But that's often way too big or way too small for the purposes that scientists need. So if you are a biochemist, we might be needing to go a lot smaller than a meter. And if you are like an astrophysicist, you might need to go a lot bigger than a meter. And so we can use these metric prefixes to kind of go down in size and bigger in size, all in terms of that base unit. So if we stick, for example, milli, which means a thousandth, in front of a meter, we get a millimeter, which is a thousandth of a meter, which is a unit that you're probably fairly familiar with. And if we go kilo, so we add a thousand times the size of a meter. Well, now we're going to get a kilometer, which is another unit that you might be familiar with. But in biochemistry, we have to go a lot, lot smaller. And thankfully, the same principles apply. And so these metric, these metric prefixes, typically they take us down by units of a thousand and much more on this in other posts. When we're talking about biological molecules, we're typically dealing on scales, like the, in terms of the size of them, we're typically dealing with things like micro and nano. And we often use this term micron. And so a micrometer is going to be a millionth of a meter or a thousandth of a milliliter. Um, so 10 to the minus six. And it's abbreviated by this mu symbol, this like Greek mu symbol. So its technical name, its SI name, is going to be a micrometer, um, but we often call it a micron. And so if you were thinking like, okay, well, why is it a micron? Why isn't it a micron? Well, there's actually a pretty interesting story where people used to call it a micron because, or people still call it a micron because it comes from Greek for micro, small, and metro, measure. Um, so basically, it's a small measurement. But of course, there's lots of lots of small things and there's lots of other small measurements. And so the SI system was like, we need more official terms. And they actually introduced micro as one of the official prefixes, meaning 10 to the minus six, so meaning millionth. 
And this meant that the micron, well, now it wasn't official. Um, and so it was kind of messing up things in terms of if you think of this as being an official sim, official prefix, and now you're saying, well, micron is going to be an actual term. Basically, they ended up demoting micron. And so micron is no longer an official SI unit as of 1967. Um, and they... So this mu symbol used to be used for micron, but now it's used for micro, which means millionth, and you can stick it in front of all different units. But we, we still often refer to this length as a micro micrometer as a micron. And so you often hear people talk about microns, and you often hear people talk about microns in the context of talking about things like cell size. So your average bacteria is going to be about a micron in diameter. Human cells are about 10 to 100 microns in diameter, and a hair is about 20 microns in diameter. Um, and so bacteria, you can see, are a lot smaller than human cells, which uh, makes sense if you think about the fact that our mitochondria, so those like powerhouses of our cells, those little compartments inside of our cells that make energy and do other things, they actually come from a cell a really, really long time ago swallowing a bacteria. So of course, our cells have to be a lot bigger than bacterial cells and the size of cells varies greatly. Um, your average red blood cell is gonna be like five to eight microns in diameter. If you have like a nerve cell, it's gonna be way longer, but it's gonna be long and skinny and things like this. At least some nerve cells, like um, neurons and stuff that go throughout your body. But anyway, bottom line is that the size of things is going to vary very greatly. Um, I don't have a very good intuitive sense of sizes, but I highly recommend this book, Cell Biology by the Numbers. So it's actually like a physical book um, by Ron Milo and Rob Phillips. I guess you can't see this because my Zoom's like blurring things out. Um, but there's a actually like a free online version. So I actually got to take like a short course in grad school from Rob Phillips and it was amazing. Um, so if you get the opportunity, um, definitely do that. Um, Ron Milo also has YouTube videos on cell biology by the numbers, like whole courses. And so I will link to those. They're really helpful. But it helps give you an idea about the relative size of things. So if we're talking about E. coli, we're talking about a bacterial cell. We're on the order of a, micro, of a micron. And if we're talking about like yeast or mammalian cells, we're getting bigger. And if we talk about things like what's inside of a cell, so things like proteins, um, glucose, water. Now we need terms to get us smaller than a micron. And so when we need to get smaller, well, now we turn back to our, our common SI prefixes. And if we go smaller than micro, we get nano and we get pico. And so a nano is a billionth and a pico is a trillionth. But actually, so sometimes we use nano, um, a nanometer, and I'll talk about this more when we get into talking about wavelengths. But when we're talking about the size and molecular distances and molecular sizes, we're actually using it, often use a unit that's not an SI unit. Um, so micron wasn't an SI unit, but it was just the term micron wasn't. And so a micro, micrometer was an SI unit or um, it was like an official term it used up one of the SI prefixes with one of the SI base units. An angstrom, it's nowhere to be found on our SI unit table, and it's not one of those factors of a thousand. Instead, it's 10 to the minus 10. So it's actually 0.1 nanometers or 100 picometers. And so why do we use this size? Why do we use this like unofficial term? Well, it's used because it's really convenient for talking about the sizes of atoms, bonds, and molecules. So if you think about your typical carbon-carbon bond, that's going to be about one and a half angstrom. And a carbon hydrogen bond is gonna be about 1.09 angstrom. And so if we were to talk about this in terms of uh, nanometers, we'd be like 0.154 or 0.109. So it's a lot easier just to talk in terms of angstroms as long as we all know what an angstrom is. It's more convenient in terms of talking about the short distances. So a bonds, bonds are around like one to one and a half angstrom. And your typical average protein is going to have a diameter of about 50 angstrom. But then again, but again, this is one of those things that's going to vary, um, vary quite greatly. When we're talking about protein size, however, well, if we want to get a look at a protein, we don't just want to get a look at the diameter usually. 
And instead, we want to get kind of a look inside the protein. So we want to be able to tell apart all those different atoms, to tell about part the carbons, tell about the oxygens and the nitrogens. And so we need to be able to resolve or tell apart these, these really small atoms that are really close together. And so we can use techniques like X-ray crystallography and cryo-EM to kind of take sort of molecular pictures. It's really not that simple. Um, but basically, you can get information about the atoms' positions within the molecules. And when we talk, of, we often refer to how like good these, these structural models are by talking about the resolution. And so resolution refers to how close two things can be. We can tell, like, resolve them or tell that they're separate things. And so if a bond is about one and a half angstrom, we need to be able to tell apart things that are one and a half angstrom. And so when we're dealing with things that are like lower than an angstrom and a half or something, then we're tough. We can refer to having like molecular resolution or atomic resolution. And so you often see the term angstrom come up when dealing with structural biology. So when dealing with things like X-ray crystallography and cryo-EM, when we have this good enough resolution um, where we can tell apart these different atoms. And it can get kind of confusing because resolution, the smaller the numbers, the higher the resolution, because the resolution is referring to how close those things can be where you can still tell them apart. And so we need that resolution. We need these numbers to be um, smaller than one and a half if we want to be able to tell apart carbon-carbon bonds. And we need it to be smaller than about an angstrom if we want it to be able to tell apart carbon hydrogen bonds. Um, and so we refer to these low numbers, these high resolution structures as having atomic resolution because we're able to resolve or tell apart those different atoms. So to review what we've talked about so far, we have a micron, which is short for micro, well, it's not short for micrometer. It's actually a term that predates the micrometer and it kind of just means small measure. Um, and it's not an official name. And to make things even con more confusing, they demoted micro, um, they demoted micron in place of micrometer, um, but a micrometer or typically more commonly pronounced like a micrometer is a measuring device, also a measuring device. So if you're talking about like the British spelling, you use the M-E-T-R-E, -E, and then it has different spellings. But in the case of in the U.S. and things where we write E-R, then we have the same word that can mean two different things. So you can have a micrometer, which is a measuring unit, or you can have a micrometer, which is a measuring device. And so, yeah, we often use the term micron when we're referring to the micrometer in biochemistry and biology. We often encounter angstroms when we're dealing with structural biology structures, but on a more practical basis, we often deal with microns in the lab when we're doing things like choosing filters to sterilize our media or to keep out other things. And so the typical bacteria is about a micrometer, um, so about a micron. Um, some bacteria are smaller, so if you think about a bacteria being like a 0.5 or so, you want to want to make sure that you're going to be able to filter those things out if you're trying to filter bacteria out of your solution. And they also have like spores and things like this that are smaller. So typically when we're doing some sort of a, um, filter filtration through a filter, if we want to be sterile, we do a 0.22 or a 0.2 micron filter, and that'll make sure that we keep out bacteria and fungi and spores and all this stuff, um, but it won't keep out some viruses which have a smaller size than bacteria because, well, the, the room way you can remember that is that viruses can infect bacteria, or at least some viruses can, like bacteriophages, and so viruses tend to be even smaller than bacteria. The viruses are often about like 0.1 to 0.3 microns or so. Um, so that 0.2 filter might not get all the viruses, um, but they typically get the bacteria and the spores and the fungi and the mold and all that stuff. The micron is very helpful for some things like when we're talking about cell diameters, but it's gonna be way too big for other purposes. And in fact, the next like SI unit down, the nanometer, well, it's actually still going to be too big for talking about things like the sizes of atoms and bonds and molecules. So, but it's not so, so much bigger than we need. It's just a little bigger than we need. So we need to go down a factor of 10 
we get to the angstrom. So an angstrom is 0.1 nanometers or 100 picometers. Um, and it's, we often you see angstrom come up when we're talking about things like bond lengths, when we're talking about resolution in structures. So we skipped over the nanometer because it wasn't quite right. I mean, you need about 10 angstroms per nanometer. And, um, but nanometer is perfect for talking about things like wavelengths. So waves basically, um, like light, wait, the wavelength of light. So light is basically these little packets of energy traveling in waves and those different packets of energy or photons have different um, amounts of energy. And the more energy they have, the faster they're going to travel up and down and up and down and up and down. And, but all light has to travel at the same speed, the speed of light. And when we're thinking about like in terms of a linear distance, so those photons with more energy have to travel up and down and up and down more in the same distance. And so they're going to have a shorter wavelength um, because they're going up and down and up and down and up and down more. They're squeezing in more of those, like um, more of those up and downs in the same distance. And so they have a shorter wavelength. And so higher energy, shorter wavelength. And we often talk about wavelengths in terms of nanometers. So if we're talking about visible light, we're talking about somewhere between like 380, 750 or so. If we're talking about ultraviolet light, we are dealing with things more in the 200 range. And we often use ultraviolet light in biochemistry because it can get absorbed by proteins and um, nucleic acids, so like DNA and RNA. And this allows us to basically see where the RNA and the protein are um, by seeing how much of this visible, how much of this ultraviolet light that they steal using machines like spectrophotometers and things. So we typically measure at 280 if we want to measure like protein concentration and 260 for nucleic acids. Um, and so when we're talking about these, we're talking about wavelengths in terms of a nanometer. But of course, although we can use these different terms to talk about these different prefixes, we can also convert in between all of these. Um, and so I have other posts on this on how you can kind of go between these different units. Um, and it's just important to remember that an angstrom is kind of not going to fit in with your typical multiply by a thousand, divide by a thousand, because an angstrom is going to be 0.1 nanometers. So it's going to be 10 to the minus 10 instead of one of those nice um, multiples of three. But it's going to be really helpful for talking about bond distances and things like this. When we need something a little bigger, then we go. When we talk about wavelengths, we talk in terms of nanometers. And when we're talking about things like cell size, we're talking typically in terms of microns. Um, and if you want um, more numbers and stuff, Wikipedia actually has some nice um, you know, to scale and things to try to tell, show you things like the sizes of various molecules. And so you can see that HIV, so this virus is going to be smaller than E. coli. Um, and it, E. coli is going to be smaller than a human cell, and a human cell is going to be smaller than a person. Um, so basically, it's really helpful to try to get an intuition for some of the things, size of these things. But hope that helps you understand when we use these units, um, even though they're kind of weirdos, like angstrom and micron are not like official terms, but we use them a lot in biochemistry, and they're really helpful for talking about the sizes of things that we want to talk about.